Hello, my name is Tiu Yu Yen, and I'm one of the editors of Academia SG. On behalf of the team, Sherry and George, Linda Lim, Ian Chong, Joanne Liao, and Cory Tan, welcome and thank you for attending this webinar. As part of our efforts to bring scholarly insights to a broader public, Acad Academia SG issues a monthly newsletter, we publish regular commentaries, and run a junior, junior scholar seminar series. We also hold occasional lectures by scholars whose work have been especially significant to Singapore scholarship and whose body of work can help us make sense of urgent contemporary issues. Today, we are very pleased that Professor Kenneth Paul Tan, exactly the sort of scholar who fits that bill, will be deliver delivering a lecture that will help us do exactly that. We're glad as well that Professor Donald Lowe will be chairing the session and be in conversation with Professor Tan. Professor Donald Lowe will be known to many of you. He's Professor of Practice at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. He's a consultant and teaches in economics and behavioral economics, complexity in public policy, and the politics and governance of Singapore. He's also a public intellectual who has published widely on these topics, including Hard Choices with Sudhir Vedeketh and PAP versus PAP with Sharon George, two important works that have informed and influenced how we think about Singapore's field of power. Um, I'm sure all of you as, are excited as we are to hear the conversation. So I will now turn it over to Donald um, for this session. Thank you, Donald. Thank you, Kenneth. Uh, thanks very much, Yu Yan. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending this lecture. I thought we were living in a post-COVID era and Zoom was a thing of the past. So I'm really uh, delighted that so many have, of you have chosen to spend your valuable Sunday afternoons uh, with uh, Kenneth and myself. I guess this being Lee Kuan Yew's uh, 100th birthday weekend makes this uh, lecture, uh, makes this session uh, even more uh, salient. Uh, it's my job to first introduce uh, Professor Kenneth Paul Tan. I'm sure many of you would be, or some of you might be familiar with his work. Uh, Kenneth is currently a professor at the Hong Kong Baptist University uh, School of Communication. Uh, let me introduce Kenneth by way of highlighting uh, through some examples how he's been quite a Prussian uh, analyst and commentator of uh, Singaporean politics. Uh, back in 2008, he had published a very influential and widely cited paper, uh, Meritocracy and Elitism in a Global City, Ideological sh uh, Shifts in Singapore. And I think that paper, more than any others, uh, kind of foreshadowed, anticipated the sort of debates that we would subsequently, Singaporean society, Singaporeans more generally, uh, had about the nature of meritocracy in Singapore and how it might be degrading, degenerating into a form of uh, elitism. I think we've had that debate for uh, for the, at least the last 15 years. And in many ways, Kenneth's paper kind of foreshadowed that, uh, anticipated that. Uh, then I think the second paper that Kenneth is widely, academic paper that Kenneth is widely known for was his 2012 paper, The Ideology of Pragmatism in Singapore, Neoliberal Globalization and Political Authoritarianism, which argues basically that, you know, the kind of pra pragmatism that was uh, practiced in Singapore, which started with very, noble and the right intentions, you know, might easily become ideologized and, you know, might become highly and unpragmatic and be used to justify crude forms of market fundamentalism and what he called neoliberal modes of governance. I think the central argument in, uh, in, uh, in many of Kenneth's uh, work on Singapore has, you know, what, what started as, gov you know, robust, sound governing ideas, governing ideals can easily become maladaptive uh, might decay, atrophy, uh, and become used in a self-rationalizing, self-justifying uh, way to justify existing policies and existing modes of doing things. And finally, in a more recent article, in fact, it came out, I think, on Friday uh, in the South China Morning Post, kind of makes the rather, or well, certainly unorthodox and somewhat provocative claim that you know, the PAP, today's PAP, rather than being a pale shadow of its former self, is really a logical extension of uh, what it was always destined to become uh, under Lee Kuan Yew's leadership. So it is with that uh, provocative argument that I hand over the time to Kenneth, who will talk us through a few things. First, the idea of decadence. Second, does thinking 
in terms of tragic outcomes? Is that a useful way to think about Singapore's future? And finally, does such catastrophizing or such catastrophic thinking, is it uh, a valuable mode of, uh, of, of, of you know, uh, critiquing or commentating or analyzing politics in Singapore? Over to you, Kenneth. Thank you. Thank you, Donald. And uh, thank you, Yoyen, as well, for these uh, really very lovely introductions. Um, I'm extremely honored, I think, to, to, to be invited to give this public lecture, especially to speak to such a large audience uh, who decided to spend their Sunday afternoon with us. Thank you very much. I hope I do a good enough job for you. Um, I want to also thank, I think, Charon George, um, who dreamt up this um, lecture event uh, many months ago. But more importantly, I want to thank him for designing this designing this uh, uh, poster that you see on the screen in front of you. Uh, I really like this poster because you can see different things in this same picture. It reflects, I think, a certain kind of ambivalence that many of us experience when we think about this Singapore that we love. Uh, looking at the image, we, we might see a breathtakingly magnificent structure. Or we might see a structure that is held up very powerfully in the center, but whose columns seem to be collapsing on both sides. Or we might see a graph, a line that uh, rises and falls. Now this idea of rising and falling, at least as it relates to cities, uh, countries and great powers in the past, is really something that's regularly discussed, I would say, in Singapore, particularly among the political and the intellectual elite. For example, PAP politicians like George Yeo and Elvin Tan many, many years ago urged us to learn lessons from Renaissance Venice. And Venice, as you know, was a geographically small, but disproportionately wealthy and, and, and powerful city-state that was, however, rather short-lived in the grand sweep of history. Chan Chun Sing, in his famous Kichu speech at the start of his political career, he asked his audience to consider the factors that led to the decline of two other small states, the Lanfang Republic in the 18th and 19th centuries and the Sultanate of Demak in the 15th and 16th centuries. From these musings, we generally learn that small states like these ones, they start to decline when bad choices are made as the geopolitical context shifts. They decline when they have not invested enough in their defense capabilities. They decline when there is division and disunity in society. And I guess above all, they decline when the quality of leadership declines. So Singapore has the benefit of hindsight and with an open and curious mind can, can learn from the mistakes of the past. But Singapore has also invested in its capabilities for anticipating the future. We have at the highest levels, developed and used tools and techniques for imagining um, plausible futures. We do this to help inform the kind of decision-making that we do in the present. In fact, our speeches very often have a future orientation. This one that you see on the screen in front of you uh, is by the deep thinking head of the um, Monetary Authority of Singapore, MES, who Gave in, they had, who gave the speech in 2015 from an imaginary vantage point of 2065. 
Now that's extraordinary. Right? And we also have had national level public engagement exercises, uh, or perhaps I should call them uh, public envisioning exercises to promote the collective imagination and the shared narration of our future. So all of this, I think, points to a very significant capacity to do what my former colleague, um, Nyo Kun Siong, many years ago would have described as um, thinking again, thinking across, and thinking ahead. But as with many things, political interests come to confound, confound them. For instance, when we start to misuse the past and the future in ways that explain, affirm, and justify how well we are doing in the present, own self, praise, own self, we might say, if only Lanfang or Demak or Venice were able to do what Singapore is doing today, they would have survived and prospered for longer. And we might even say, if we in Singapore want to survive and prosper for longer, then we had better ensure we have the right leaders. And at this point, we know, of course, what right leaders is code for, right? It means vote for the People's Action Party and not for opposition politicians. So it kind of gets into this sort of mess at some point. Uh, let's put that aside for a minute. And let me say something about research. Now, most academics, I think, shy away from talking about the future, uh, and for good reasons, I think. However, when looking back on some of my own publications, I find that I have often gotten away with writing about how things might evolve into the foreseeable future. And I want to highlight uh, three of these publications for you. Donald has already mentioned two of them. Now, the, the, the first one is this, this article in 2008 in which I described how meritocracy, a key factor in Singapore's success story, had been uh, shifting over the decades in the direction of a crude form of elitism. Uh, the focus on meritocracy had shifted from opportunity to allocation to competition and to reward. And I argued that the systemic transformations from survivalism to developmentalism and to neoliberal globalization, which is the current stage that Global City Singapore is in, would cause the further weakening of Singapore's meritocracy as a glue that holds society together. Today, uh, 15 years later, I can safely say that I, I think I was mostly right about this. Now, here's the second article. <clears throat> Uh, also referred to by Donald, uh, published in 2012, and in which I discussed how Singapore's thoughtful, courageous, and more dynamic practice of pragmatism, another key uh, factor in the Singapore success story, had degraded over time into a rigid ideology. In fact, into what I now recognize as a dogmatic adherence to the overriding value of economic growth, and the pervasive logic of the market that governs and thereby uh, constrains in sometimes very, very crude ways, nearly every sphere of our lives. Now, let me bring to your attention a third uh, article, which Donald didn't refer to. And this is a 2011 chapter, a simple chapter, uh, in which I wrote about the Greek myth of Narcissus and Echo and what this myth can tell us about Singapore. So here's the story. A very handsome Narcissus was so in love with his own image reflected in the river that he ended up drowning in it. So I asked the question, would the PAP government also drown in its own self-absorption? Now in the story also is the nymph echo of the water spirit who sought the romantic attention of Narcissus, but she was cursed never to be listened to. And I asked, maybe a little playfully, would, would the people of Singapore, including its loving critics, be detached from a self-regarding and quite possibly narcissistic political elite, and in that way be reduced to a mere echo 
Now, since the time I wrote these and other pieces like them, the situation, I think it's fair to say, seems to have worsened. By 2019, I was giving lectures with titles like uh, Singapore's finest years coming to an end. I was starting to think specifically about decay and whether it was fair or even useful to think of Singapore as a decadent technocracy. This was, to be sure, a painful exercise. As Singapore is my country, and I have often spoken very proudly of its achievements, its considerable achievements, and of what others may choose to learn from them. But I also believed uh, that if, as a scholar, you cared enough about your country, you, you would have to speak up. Now this year, what were described as political scandals in Singapore made, made the headlines around the world, prompting uh, many observers to ask and maybe attempt to address the, the question of whether something uh, was going very badly wrong in Singapore. Among these questions was whether this principle of own self check own self was beginning to show its practical limitations. Uh, or should we believe that it was clearly working, working well by virtue of the fact that these cases had, after all, been surfaced and then dealt with openly and decisively? Did people have reason to expect even worse scandals to come? And if so, was there a need for better checks and balances? I mean, these are clearly not easy questions to answer. And we can no longer, it would seem, rely on past examples alone to convince ourselves that own self can indeed check own self today as PAP politicians uh, keep insisting. But what has changed in post-LKY Singapore, post Lee Kuan Yew Singapore? Some people think that after rising to some level of greatness, Singapore is now starting to decline. And this is because of the quality of leadership and a system that is kind of fraying and starting to break down. Others think that Singapore hasn't really changed enough, but needs to, so that it can cope with and benefit from the changing circumstances. Yet others believe that Singapore's rise to some level of greatness always contained the seeds of its own decline. Yeah, those who don't think the past was all that great in the first place, and that the success was just an illusion, a product of nostalgia and selective history. And there are those who say it is simply meaningless to compare past and present. Now, depending on, on where you look, uh, and where you're standing, they are all in, in some way or other correct. All these positions are correct. But to think more systematically about these pers perspectives and perhaps more deeply, I decided to write a book. So I have decided to write a book, which I want to call Decadent Technocracy, Tragic Narratives of Neoliberal Singapore. Uh, what I'm presenting to you in the public lecture today uh, essentially some insights from the first chapter that looks at the Singapore story as tragedy. So um, let me, without going into too much detail or any detail, tell you a little bit more about the concerns of the book. Uh, you can see that it explores possible paths of future decay. For example, the idea that meritocracy can decay into a kind of what I want to call a mediocracy how multiracialism can degrade into cultural paralysis, pragmatism into market fundamentalism on the one hand and moral hypocrisy on the other, inclusion into division and exclusion, and then a high trust society into a, a forms of populist authoritarianism. Uh, and I want to do this uh, in a way that draws on the notion of the tragic. So what, what makes all of this Tragic. In this list here of eight things, I guess 
are my starting points. Right? These are the tragic elements that I want to use in my analysis. I want to look at how what we're really talking about are good and great people. We're not talking about bad people making evil decisions. Uh, uh, it's, it's not that kind of story, right? It's a story about essentially good people wanting to do their best um, and to lead a heroic effort for a nation to survive and prosper. Secondly, this success is achieved, is acknowledged, is rewarded. Thirdly, buoyed by you know, this immense confidence and motivation, the heroes of the story subsequently push in extreme directions, well beyond human limits. And in that, the intoxication of that moment, right, flaws that are embedded in all of us by virtue of being human, and the system, flaws that are embedded in the system that we have built, they get unleashed and are magnified and they come back to us as a kind of destructive or self-destructive force. Uh, in the process, mistakes are made and because of a lack of self-knowledge or, or the, the, the lack of willingness to, to, to acknowledge our weaknesses, um, these mistakes are denied and we descend into catastrophe. Now, self-knowledge comes, self-consciousness comes, but it comes much too late in the story. And then as we observe this playing out of the broad historical arc of tragedy, we learn something, right? we feel something. And maybe the last point is, is really where the, the, the real tragedy is, right? in that we, we knew all of this. And we, we, we talked about Venice, we talked about Lanfang, we talked about Denmark, and perhaps future people will look back and think about Singapore too, and how we kind of fell, rose and fell tragically. So now, let us look at the Singapore story and see what a tragic reading might do to it. So this is all very familiar, right? We begin as a small, uh, young, vulnerable nation state with limited resources. Uh, and we managed to not only survive, but to even succeed magnificently against the odds. But this success is fragile and it takes a heroic effort by good and great leaders to develop Singapore and establish strong uh, foundations for continued success. Now this success is not only maintained according to the story, but increased as leaders align themselves wholeheartedly with market principles. But the epic human endeavor that makes us more, or that rather moves us from a, a, a developmental heroism to neoliberal good governance and its amplification easily turns to hubris and narcissism. We become self-absorbed extremists. And in that moment, unleash self-destructive forces that bring unintended consequences, potentially reversing our fortune. Now, I'll come back to what these unintended consequences are. But first, I want to illustrate this idea of tragedy uh, a bit more vividly by juxtaposing the Singapore story with other timeless stories containing some strong, tragic elements. Uh, first, is the Greek myth of Icarus and his father Daedalus. Now, both of them, they're, they're filled with ingenuity, right? So both of them construct wings out of feathers and wax. And this enables them to fly. Now, the wise father tells Icarus to be careful and not to fly too high. But of course, in the sheer exhilaration of flight, Icarus disregards this advice and he flies so high that he approaches the sun. And here in this painting, the sun is represented by Apollo riding a chariot. Uh, Apollo, of course, is the god of the sun, but he is also a god of reason, rationality, and order. So in a sense, Icarus is not only exceeding human limitations, but he is defying the gods and he's defying the proper order of things. And as a result, the rays of the sun melt the wax and Icarus falls to his death. You know, as we commonly say, pride leads to a fall, 
and the higher you climb, the harder you fall. Now here's a second story, the Tower of Babel, which of course is uh, from Christian scripture. Uh, this is a story about a united and ambitious people who decide to build a tower so tall that it would reach the heavens. God disapproves of this hubris and curses the project to failure simply by making them all speak different languages in order to divide them. So he sort of separated them through diversity. And here's a third story. Uh, again, the myth of Narcissus and Echo, which I already described earlier, but just to remind you, Narcissus is so in love with himself that he drowns in self-absorption. Echo craves his attention, but she is cursed never to have her own voice. And so she is reduced merely to a haunting echo. Right, now the fourth story. Animal Farm, which I remember first reading for the literature exam when I was uh, perhaps ironically a student in an elite secondary school in Singapore many, many decades ago. Uh, interestingly, we read it only as an allegory of how the historic communist revolution in Russia had led to far greater tyranny. So here's the story. Farm animals dominated and exploited by their human masters fight successfully for their freedom and equality. Their industrial policy delivers great economic success, which becomes the model for the world. One of the leaders quickly comes to dominate and accuses his rivals and critics of treachery, banishing them as traitors. The leader formulates a unifying ideology that is actually based on exclusion, all in an attempt to brainwash the animals and to shut down alternative thought. The animals work very hard for very long hours, motivated by the goal of progress for the farm. They have to give up part of what they make to the leaders of the farm and are told that it is for their own good, although they never get to know how it is used. Those who are deemed less productive when they get older are viewed as a burden and are removed from sight. The pigs, who are the smartest among the animals, form a new elite class, enjoying lavish lifestyles, while the lower animals continue to struggle. The leaders reward themselves for being able to make the lower animals work harder for much less compensation. Now, once conditions become intolerable, the lower animals revolt and overturn the tyranny of the pigs. So the original revolutionary goal of equality, according to Orwell, so easily slips into a new exploitative elitism. All right, enough of that. Uh, so now let's come back to Singapore. What are likely to be the unintended consequences that arise from the tragic arc of the Singapore story? First, we have already seen the widening of inequality, not only of income, but of also wealth. And we also know that no matter how skillfully the statistics might be presented to suggest the problem is not so serious, the reality of inequality, especially in a dense, wealthy, increasingly expensive global city like Singapore, is experienced in everyday life and cannot so readily be trivialized by technocratic explanations. Other forms of inequality have also come to the fore. For instance, in the public discourse of multiracial and cosmopolitan Singapore, it has become much harder to solve inequalities of race, gender, sexuality, class, and the complex intersections among them. There are visible signs of poverty in this wealthy global city, 
even though official calculations of a poverty line are unavailable. There is dogged refusal to institute minimum wage in the firm belief that a more gradual and sectorally targeted um, progressive wage model is superior. Researchers tell us that every night, more than a thousand people sleep on the streets and are thought to be homeless. Now, Singaporeans complain and foreigners observe that Singapore is a stressful place to work in. Singaporeans work long hours for salaries that seem to them unable to match the rising cost of living. And for careers whose um, prospects they suspect are, are limited because of unfair neoliberal practices, uh, the, the, the idea of foreign talent comes to this story too. They are sleep deprived, highly stressed, exhausted, and concerned about their mental health. No wonder then that Singapore has one of the lowest birth rates in the world. Market fundamentalism, wonderful for globalization's winners, but it can bring hardship to the lives and the livelihoods of its losers who wonder if their government is doing enough to redistribute globalization's gains. But market fundamentalism can also keep the economy stagnant in its narrow calculations, risk aversion, and lack of imagination. Meanwhile, laudable practices of meritocracy, which again was a key element of the success story, has degenerated into crude expressions of elitism. To those ordinary Singaporeans who feel burnt out in the constant pursuit of opportunities that seem ever more elusive, members of the establishment can appear entitled, condescending, arrogant, and yet not a little insecure as they justify with mechanical repetitiveness those neoliberal policies that seem primarily to favor themselves. From this vantage point, the view of how the wealthy and the powerful live in crazy rich Singapore is hard to accept. The opulent image of the elite contrasts starkly with the reputation for austerity that Lee Kuan Yew's team uh, carefully cultivated in their leadership of what now seems like a, a very long ago uh, Singapore. And as today's elite circles become increasingly closed, we can expect to find institutional decay and shall we say cultural and intellectual exhaustion. These are fertile grounds, I believe, for the rise of authoritarian forms of populism, first on the right and then on the left. Out of the elite circle and fueled by growing intra-elite intra rivalries, I think will emerge demagogues, charismatic and manipulative sweet talkers who are more interested in building a mass support base and doing this by channeling popular energies and frustrations and anger against the traditional establishment and against the plural society. If we are not careful, Singapore may become a starkly divided society with low levels of trust whose public language is filled with condescension, bullying, hate speech, and conspiracy theories. And this reminds me of a fifth story with tragic elements, Frankenstein. Through the lens of this well-known book by Mary Shelley, we can see how the heroic efforts to build a perfect society when taken to extremes can result in grotesque creation. That if we were to disavow or not take enough responsibility for, can come back to kill us all. And there are several Frankensteinian examples that come to my mind when I think of Singapore's political trajectory. One has to do with high political salaries which the neoliberalized Lee Kuan Yew himself controversially insisted in the 1990s would be vital for improving the quality of future leadership. 
Of course, no, no sensible Singaporean would begrudge paying their need as well, as I've said before. But paying them salaries that are so much higher than other world leaders is hard to stomach. The justificatory language surrounding high political salaries can turn elitism into boastfulness, which in turn can set rather unrealistic expectations among the people of their government leaders, expectations that extend into their private lives even. High salaries have not eliminated high-level corruption, it would seem, and high political salaries can discourage out-of-the-box thinking and taking responsibility for courageous decisions, since the opportunity cost of failure seems so much higher. Even worse, the implicit connections between high salaries, cabinet positions, and political loyalty can lead to groupthink and formulate responses of the, the very worst kind. Even as evolving circumstances and challenges demand fresh perspectives, and approaches. Now here's a second example of a Frankensteinian monster that Donald reminded me yesterday. Uh, it's the group representation constituency system that was established in the 1980s. There are strong arguments, of course, for and against its uh, official rationale uh, about positive discrimination in the name of multiracialism. But the unintended consequences of um, Establishing such a bold institution would include shepherding untested young technocrats into powerful positions where they would continue to be protected from the real challenges of politics and democracy. In a sense, the younger generation of leaders has been infantilized by a protectionist system and will be found lacking in political leadership skills, resorting to repressive actions when they cannot persuade, much less inspire. So here's a third example of a Frankensteinian monster and it's the elected presidency of today. Now, so much has already been said about it, so I really won't add anything new, only to say that it is such a convoluted, contradictory and confusing institution for voters and even experts that it is bound at some point to unleash self-destructive energies that will regrettably be difficult to keep under control. So how can we minimize or even avert the unintended consequences of our tragic choices? Uh, a former student of mine very recently introduced to me, or recommended to me a book by Robert Kaplan uh, titled The Tragic Mind. And I haven't read it carefully enough, but what I understand from it is that he argues uh, generally, that American political leaders in their foreign policy decisions should adopt a tragic mindset. And I think this is quite instructive for us, right? When faced with a number of apparently good options, um, they should consider the catastrophes that may be unleashed by any one of these options, making their choices based on the avoidance of the greatest catastrophes. Uh, this, if I understand correctly, uh, and at its heart, uh, requires humility, not hubris, but humility. But what can help good and great people to be humble? I want to suggest that this is a role that the critic can play. And I want now to flesh out these roles by asking you to consider a few stories with, a, with some tragic elements that feature critical figures. The first and most tragic is Shakespeare's King Lear. I want to think about three types of critics in this play. The tragedy of Lear begins, it begins when he invites his three daughters to tell him how much they love him so that he can, according to how much they say they love him, give each of them a suitable part of his kingdom. Goneril waxes lyrical about her love for her father, the king. Then Regan manages even to outdo her sister 
in expressing her love for the king, her father. But when it's the turn of Leah's third daughter, Cordelia, who in fact loves him the most, and whom he loves the most, she refuses to engage in flattery and probably assumes that her father is wise enough to recognize authenticity and distinguish that from fakery. She is tragically mistaken. For Leah in his vanity is instead deeply insulted by her truthfulness and he becomes resentful. In a rage, he casts her out of his kingdom and divides this kingdom between the two manipulative daughters instead. Now, before too long, here's the most tragic part of it, Goneril and Regan strip their father of the trappings of his power and cast him out into the wilderness where he descends into madness. I am reminded of an article I wrote in 2009 in which I analyzed the oddly violent language that the PAP government had used in its extended reprimand of uh, novelist Catherine Lim after she had written commentaries suggesting that the Singapore government no longer enjoyed the affection of its people. It was then puzzling to me why such an innocent comment would have elicited such a ferocious response. Perhaps if I had thought about King Lear then, it might have been clearer. I'm also reminded of what Tommy Koh, Professor Tommy Koh said not very long ago about how Singapore does not need sycophants, but loving critics. So other than the sycophantic critic and the loving critic, King Lear also offers us a vision of the fool as critic. The fool or the uh, court jester is really the only, the only one licensed to make fun of the king. In other words, to speak truth to power, as it were. A powerful king understands the importance of being grounded and empowers the fool to keep him well informed and in check. In the play, Lear is entertained by his fool, but apparently fails to hear the wisdom behind the jokes. And when it is too late, the fool disappears altogether from the play. Let me suggest that there is a role, there is a role for the fool in the Singapore government. And this role is in fact played by the various officers and agencies whose task it is to think strategically and in the long term. In 1995, the scenario planning office was formed within the prime minister's office to perform exactly such a service. Like the fool who delivers sometimes very uncomfortable truths by channeling them through wit and humor, the SPO could also communicate unorthodox, unsettling, and challenging ideas to the authorities through formalized techniques of scenario planning. And this is exactly what they did. Their first national scenarios delivered in 1997 described two plausible futures. The first, titled Hotel Singapore, envisioned a city where people would not sink real roots, but merely treat the city as a place to profit from and to pass through. The second, titled A Home Divided, saw a future Singapore that lacked social cohesion, divided along race, religion, language, class, and other social lines. Uh, now we've had almost 30 years of foresight work in Singapore. Um, a lot of it is, uh, is not open to the public. I do wonder if unlike Leo, our leaders found these kinds of scenarios more than just entertaining. Let me now present to you a second story with tragic elements about the fate of critics. And this is William Golding's novel, Lord of the Flies. So here's the story, right? A group of British 
public school students are plane wrecked on, a, on an island. Very quickly, they degenerate into, from, a, from, a, from civilization into a kind of, of, of barbarism, or savagery. Uh, a leader eventually emerges who uses fear of an unseen monster to manipulate the other boys into loyalty and obedience. Now, one of the boys uh, you see in, in, the, in the still of the screen, Simon, chances upon the truth. He discovers that there is no monster. And he's anxious to come back, right? So he come, as, he, as he comes back to tell the others, the boys, in a ritual frenzy, mistake him for the monster and they kill him. Now, the symbolism of this is quite powerful. It points to how dangerous it can be for critics who perhaps naively tell truths that challenge the basis of authority. This also reminds me of Plato's allegory of the cave, which you find in this Republic. In this allegory, Plato tells us that we mostly live in a world of shadows. And most of us aren't even aware of this. But when some of us break out of this world and uh, world of shadows and through philosophy, uh, discover the truth behind it, we are usually reluctant to come back and tell others for fear of being ridiculed or even being killed. Now let's talk about childlike innocence. I was tickled to discover this uh, uh, Singapore stamp in 2004 that depicted the Empress New Clothes, a uh, fairy tale by Hans uh, Christian Anderson. Uh, in it, we are told that it takes the fearless innocence and honesty of a little boy to point out what every adult could surely see, but refuse to acknowledge that the vain emperor was in fact naked. Now, even as the emperor tried to contain his humiliation, there were no terrible consequences for the boy, as far as I can tell. But this is rather less true of another boy who innocently contributed an idea that would save his village. So that's made by some students at Nanya Polytechnic. Um, and it's about Hal Nadim in the legend of Red Hill. And in this legend, the ruler was jealous of the boy's ingenuity and the admiration he earned from the people. And so he killed the boy. In Singapore today, someone might ask, um, is it so important for the government to assert its monopoly on all good ideas that it needs to exclude those who from outside its circle are happy to give constructive criticism and other contributions. So here's the last part of this lecture. I began by talking about the power of hindsight and foresight in Singapore and how some of my own research has not shied away from this, making predictions about how a magnificent country like Singapore can unravel over time. I explained how I got to thinking about the literary form of tragedy as a way to make sense of post Lee Kuan Yew Singapore. By referring to well-known myths and stories, I highlighted those aspects of tragedy that could enable us to read the Singapore story differently and to understand the significance of unintended consequences that can lead to Singapore's decline. I wondered if leaders could adopt a tragic mind tragic mindset that is primarily characterized by humility. And I suggested that the critic can play a constructive part in this. I refer to another set of well-known myths and stories to identify the significance of being a critic in Singapore. And now I want to outline what the critic is up against in a Singapore where hubris rather than humility prevails. First, if you are a critic who is pragmatic, manipulable, perhaps naive, you might be 
co-opted, flattered, and promoted, making you easier to neuter. If you are a critic who touches on matters that are peripherally important to the establishment, or you engage in details on the surface rather than structural problems, you might simply be tolerated, ignored, or perhaps even displayed in ways that contribute to a, a, a progressive, open, and inclusive branding of global city Singapore. Uh, if, however, you go deeper in your critique and are resistant to simple threats and rewards, life might become a little more difficult for you as you become more aware of the rising cost of criticism. Now, if you remain recalcitrant, you might find yourself in trouble with the law and have to leave. This way, critics like this can be simply eliminated right, or held up usefully as an image of external threat, the bogeyman. Uh, those who continue to be resistant towards these strategies may end up turning to the disgruntled masses to build support, where they can present themselves as martyrs or activate the skills of demagoguery in a gradual slide down to authoritarian forms of populism. Now, of course, to understand critics and their prospects for helping engender a usefully tragic mind among the leaders, it is much more complicated. Who are the critics really loyal to? And what and how do they criticize? Do they go deep? Do they go shallow? Do they want to work towards consensus? Do they want always to be the voice that challenges any consensus? All of, the, all of these uh, types have their value and their place. But I want to take this back to the central idea in this lecture, which is tragedy and the value of catastrophic thinking, where people imagine the worst possible outcomes for a situation or event, focusing on catastrophically negative consequences. The priestess Cassandra is described in the Iliad as blessed with the gift of prophecy, but she is cursed never to be listened to. Ancient philosophers, PAP politicians, and even I have indulged in catastrophizing. Some of us are never properly listened to. I'm trying to figure out why we do it. I have some idea there on the screen, but I do need to think some more and more deeply about it. As a matter of fact, I think Lee Kuan Yew, the complex man that he was, also had a knack for catastrophizing, catastrophic thinking. In some respects, he did have a tragic mind. He refused to be monumentalized or memorialized, warning himself and others to remember Ozymandias, the ancient king whose sad ruins were all that were left of his great deeds. Maybe we are the ones who must break out of this infantilizing cycle and stop turning his legacy into another Frankensteinian monster. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Anna. Uh, that was a fantastic lecture. I think you covered so much and uh, you drew on such a wide uh, variety, I think, of... Uh, wait, let me say, I, I can't start my video. Can Can the organizers help me or unlock my video. Once you're doing that, I'm gonna get out of the sun. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the sun is setting now in Hong Kong. <clears throat> well, nonetheless, let's, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to start the video, but uh, since time is short and uh, we've got quite a lot of questions to go through, why don't I start the, uh, the Q and A? Uh, thanks very much. Uh, um, well, thanks, thanks very much for the fantastic lecture and, and, and the wide range of myths, metaphors, stories, allegories that you, you know, peppered your lecture with. I counted at least 10 uh, reasonably well-known of these. Uh, so that's, I mean, you, you can write an entire book just based on those 10. Those are your 10 chapters, right? Each of these yes, that's being, true, a, yeah. being a tragic story uh, in its own right. Uh, I was kind of hoping that at, at the end you would offer an optimistic 
prognosis or at least an optimistic scenario of how might critics uh, avert tragedy. Uh, uh, but your examples of the critic were mostly negative ones, whether it's Cordelia, the fool, uh, they, you know, their fates did not end well. Uh, so I was wondering if, is it necessarily the case that the tragic mind, embracing the tragic mind necessarily entails uh, tragic consequences for, for, for the critics? Uh, so that would be my, my first question. The other, I think, related to that question is I, I like very much uh, the use of the phrase, the tragic art, you know, embrace uh, or, or thinking in terms of tragedy, uh, thinking how our story, the Singapore story in this instance, might have a tragic arc. Uh, and I'm reminded of Martin Luther King's famous uh, quotation, right? The, uh, the, arc, the, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. So how would you contrast that inherent optimism, right? And maybe it's the American dream, maybe it's I, I would say the Singapore story so far, you know, uh, even though it's been, it has been, uh, you know, uh, portrayed in very, in a particular way, it's also an inherently optimistic one. And and so how would you counter that optimism or how should we think about that optimism uh, while infusing uh, tragic elements, while still encompassing within it uh, this tragic arc that you talked about? Mm -hmm. Oh, great, great questions. Um, so I, I think that um, adopting the tragic mind, or let's let's maybe not say tragic mind, let's think of it as the tragic imagination, right? mm -hmm. uh, actually is probably an important step that we can take to escape tragic outcomes. It's the not knowing about the catastrophic outcomes right. that can um, result from a choice that we make amongst good options, right? We're not, we're not considering bad options, right? We're, that what makes it tragi tragic is these are all good things that we want, right? What the PAP government has pursued, what Lee Kuan Yew had envisioned, these are all great things and they're morally defensible and, you know, they're, they're, they're breathtaking, right? In the, in the, in the magnificence of, of, of the human uh, imagination. Um, but if we simply focus on what we want to achieve, and then we pursue that with a kind of extremist um, outcome, uh, uh, extremist um, uh, energy, right? uh, we don't pay enough attention. This is where the tragic imagination comes in. Right? We don't pay attention to the very real catastrophic outcomes that can accompany mm -hmm. any of these morally defensible um, uh, uh, highly admirable uh, goals that we pursue. So I think having this tragic outcome, and this is where I think sometimes the, what looks like the pessimism of critics can play into the system very, very constructively because listen to the critics, right? They're not there to make you look bad. <laughs> They're not there to, you know, kind of throw, uh, uh, you know, throw paint on, on, on your, uh, to deface your, your mural. It's not that, right? They're offering you uh, a wider set of imagination, of imagining right, of where things can go wrong, even with the best of intentions. And the tragic mindset, I think, of the tragic imagination is, is generous enough, right? And wise enough and humble enough mm. to pay attention mm. to these catastrophic stories in such a way that we can then say, okay, let's choose the best outcome amongst these, uh, best option amongst these many good options taking into account the worst catastrophes that might occur. Mm -hmm. uh, if, you know, and you can only do that if you listen, right? If you listen to the bad stories the, mm. or the worst things that can happen. So I, I, I find that we, you know, especially in the more celebratory moments of Singapore, uh, we become disdainful towards those who seem to be wet blankets, right? <laughs> Critics <laughs> become this, you know, like, uh, right. why aren't you? enjoying the, the, yeah. the wondrous... Uh, uh, Scrooge, why are you such a Scrooge? Yeah, why are you such a Grinch or a Scrooge, right? But, but it's not that, because, mm -hmm. and, you know, if we, if we ignore the Grinches and the Scrooges, right, we, we, we do that at our peril, I, I, I think. So I, I don't know if that answers both your questions. Yeah, it does, it does. Yeah. Uh, that's a great, great uh, clarification in terms of 
who's, who's expected to have the tragic imagination. Uh, one of the thoughts I did have also was uh, a lot of your talk seems to be directed at elites, right? Governing elites, decision makers. They should be the ones who have this tragic imagination. Do you, in, in this in this formulation of the Singapore story where we are big-hearted enough, and not just big-hearted enough, but in our own, for our own self-interest, right? We can, we, we can, we, we also have a tragic imagination. Is there a role for citizens, uh, for, for the man in the street? Uh, should they also think catastrophically? And what is the role for institutions? I mean, how do we yeah. shape or even reform our institutions with a view to avert catastrophic outcomes or tragic outcomes. In many ways, if you think about whether it's the elected presidency or the GRC, uh, you, you describe them as Frankensteinian, or, or we, we had discussed them as being Frankensteinian creations. In many ways, they were created to avert what in Lee Kuan Yew's mind would be catastrophic outcomes, right? Not having uh, racial rep sufficient ethnic representation in parliament, having a rogue government. So how do we prevent those or how do we check those the worst of that scenarios? We create these... Uh, uh, counteracting uh, institutions, modifications to the electoral system, creating the office of the elect elected presidency. So, you know, what, what, is, what is the role of institutions and what is the role of citizens uh, in, 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 th in thinking, you know, in, in having a tragic mind? Okay, uh, great questions. Um, okay, now let's maybe illustrate it with the example that you gave of the elected presidency, right? So, this is a great example because um, here you had a very clear-minded approach to a possible political problem in Singapore, at least mm -hmm. as it is viewed by the incumbent, right? That somehow or other, all the great savings and you know every kind of capital that we have accumulated um, uh, uh, at the the <laughs> Singapore would be squandered if right. the you know, the competitive nature of the, the political system suddenly freaked out, right, and produced the wrong kind of government, right? And of course, we know what that implicitly means. Mm -hmm. And that becomes important, actually, because mm -hmm. if the imagination of the catastrophic is actually curtailed by party political considerations, that doesn't, to, in my mind, mm -hmm. constitute the tragic imagination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so how do we get past that, right? Well, first of all, you know, it's the gargantuan expectation that people can think outside of partisan uh, <laughs> restrictions and, and affiliations, right? Can you actually imagine beyond the party political if you think that the party political interest is at the heart of national interest? Mm -hmm. um, and if you can, then where should these so alternative ideas come in, right? Who will tell you if, let's say, you have a particular... Uh, intelligence, right, that thinks of human nature in a particular way, uh, who will tell you that human nature is, is also like this or like that, right, there's a diversity of different motivations and incentives and, 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 and things that we, we need to take into account that could lead to radically different uh, possibilities. And that's where your, I think your first couple of questions come in, right, which is what's the role for institutions and the role for for the, for, for the people, broadly speaking. Uh, institutions, I think, is clearer to me. Uh, but I, it, it's, you know, the fact that our government has actually invested in these, you know, um, like delivery, um, foresight units and, you know, at the prime minister office level, but also little units in different ministries, that's a very positive sign, right? That is a government big enough to at least say, let's carve out this space within our, you know, within our big uh, uh, government institution has come up these spaces where people can be expected to think differently, right, to challenge our assumptions and all that. Now, this is remarkably difficult to get right, right, because if you were hired to do this job, uh, the, the, the better of a job that you do, the more irritating you will be to the powers that be, right? So in a sense, the better, you know, the, the more of a fool you are, the more you're going to irritate the king. The king may just one day snap and then and, and off with your head, right? So it's a, it's a very delicate kind of space. Now, I don't know enough details whether um, in practice this has worked or not, whether these institutional spaces in government have actually right. delivered alternatives that have been taken seriously in the assessment yeah. of yeah. I'm not sure, right? Yeah. At least in design, it's there. Now, then the broader society, uh, you know, 
the, the possible spaces where things like that can happen are obviously consultation and, and engagement and all of that. But of course, because there is such a profound um, pessimism and skepticism about the capacity of, 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 of uh, um, the crowd right, to deliver any kind of wisdom here in Singapore, um, those occasions tend to be more celebratory and deliberately designed to point towards optimistic outcomes, right? Mm -hmm. And in that sense, then they become useless for the task of um, uh, virtual, for the task of imagining um, uh, catastrophes uh, mm. or greater catastrophes, right? So, I mean, so back to the elected president. So you have Lee Kuan Yew has a particular view of people and what motivates them and a particular view of opposition politicians and, you know, uh, the, the nature of democratic politics, he has a particular view of that. Uh, and based on that, he chooses an, uh, he chooses, uh, an approach that can limit a catastroph that catastrophic outcome, but he fails to see that there can be even more catastrophic outcomes that result from designing a monstrous institution, right? And then at the end of the day, it doesn't have a clear purpose, you know, primes and conditions. Uh, elect um, voters and citizens in, in ways that you know you mm -hmm. will go under control at some point, right? And that could be a greater evil, right? Right. So, yeah. <laughs> does that kind of answer it? It does. Uh, let, let me turn to some of the questions that our audience have thrown out and they've been incredibly patient uh, to 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 uh, uh, to to have me uh, read out their questions. So so one is you know you you talked about Venice. Uh, and and certainly when our politicians refer to Venice is with you know it's a it's a cautionary tale Venice Venice oh Venice yeah yeah you know when they re do refer to it as, as a cautionary tale right and to reflect also to reinforce how uh, unusual our success is so it's again celebratory when we do refer to to Venice but also to highlight our inherent vulnerability the scarcity of resources because like Venice we are small we lack natural resources so one of the questions was. Uh, you no, know, he thinks that Krishna says he thinks our scarcity survivalism narrative is overplayed and maybe even false. Singapore has always been in a strategic location, surrounded by a sea as a vast resource, fantastically located, been a hub for trade and commerce for centuries. How might this false start, right, or this false narrative at the start uh, affect this tragic narrative up? Yeah, I mean, uh, yes, I mean it's an example clearly of how uh, history can be very selectively mined, right? To, to produce the kind of ideological resources that we, 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 we want to construct into, you know, some sort of sense of shared purpose, shared destiny, where we came from, which all are, are all the elements of the Singapore story. So I, I think it's true, we subjugate uh, the past uh, to present purposes, right? Mm. Uh, and of course it becomes even more uh, problematic because present purposes are, also, in a sense, they reduce to party political purposes as well, right? So it becomes a question of, you know, everything sort of becomes, uh, we're small, we're, 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 uh, we, we lack, right? We lack. So the language of deficiency uh, comes to dominate our sense of who we are, right? And it almost, almost in, tra tragically, <laughs> I use the word tragic here loosely, right? Tragically, in almost every way, right? We, 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 um, we think we're not good enough, right? We think, um, elsewhere is definitely better than us other people are definitely better than us and uh, it happens at every level here it's not just the government that treats the people this way right but we treat each other this way too right that we're somehow we don't take pride in our uh, accomplishments we look down on one another and then when one of us does brilliantly internationally then everybody wants a selfie with him and you know it's, it's that kind of mentality that that um really springs from this sense that we are nothing, we are nothing, we, you know, we don't even deserve to, to, to be, right? We don't even deserve to be. We have to make an outsized claim about uh, the usefulness, our usefulness to the, to the uh, broader international community. So on the one hand, right, it's, it, in the early decades, it is useful for generating a certain kind of um, um, don't be complacent, right? So generating a certain kind of let's work together, let's put energy into this. This is a project worth pursuing. We can do it. It's not going to be hard. If we achieve something, it's not going to be permanent. So it can motivate, but after a while, it can innovate, right? It can it can just drain you of resources of of of, yeah. of dignity, creative thinking, yeah. 
Absolutely. So I, I, I mean, I don't know if that speaks to the tragic thing, you know, but it certainly is not a terribly useful yeah. position. Yeah. And it makes us, you know, we don't want to take courageous, make courageous decisions. You know, we don't want to think outside the box, right? Because opportunity cost of doing that seems outsized, right? Really uh, disproportionately high when we speak mm-hmm. the language of scarcity and, and um, you vulnerability. Know, constant vulnerability overnight. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree. I don't I don't I think every time they make references to Lan Fang or Venice as, as you put it in the lecture, I don't think it's driven by, you know, let's think of some of the catastrophic outcomes. It's driven more by a self-serving narrative of this is why you need us, right? The PAP leadership. Yeah. Right? I think so, so. so yeah so it's not an example of tragic thinking. And let me switch to elections, which I think uh, is still on people's minds. And in one of your Facebook posts uh, publicizing this talk was, does, you, you asked the pro- somewhat provocative question was, does Taman's big win, or I should say, does Tama, President Taman's big win, uh, does it signify that, uh, that negate, right? Does it negate this catastrophic thinking? Does, do you think, what, what, what do you think? Do you think that uh, President Taman's victory uh, is a, a sig- signals a step in the direction of averting catastrophic outcomes. Uh, and also there was a question in relation to election. In fact, there are a few questions in relation to elections. One was about the disconnect of the PAP with uh, the Singaporean common folks. I think you alluded to that with the elitism, the inequality, the, the hubris. Uh, and he says, it reminds me of how Malaysia's Baris- Barisan-, Barisan National has been massively, became massively detached from uh, Malaysian citizens prior to their electoral collapse in 2018. Uh, so do you think something similar would happen in Singapore? So, you know, how, how should we think about elections, uh, both the recent presidential elections, and does this way of thinking, you know, does it help us make sense or analyze elections uh, in any uh, meaningful way? Wow, well, very, very difficult questions. Mm-hmm. But, uh, I mean, there's so many things that can be said and have been said about the president. Uh, elected president uh, presidency elections and um i mean let me just maybe just let me just uh, tell a, a tragic story right okay. um so if we were to think tragically uh, about it and to imagine the catastrophic outcomes right um then one story that we we prob- we can entertain is what does it mean for this most talented of singaporeans right who happens to be indian what does it mean for him to not find um, uh, a suitable place in the apex of the cabinet, but to find a, a, a place in a much less politically and constitutionally powerful institution as the presidency? Um, what, what does it mean for a system to sort such a person, right? Who by anyone's reckoning could be prime minister. Right? But what's, what, does, what does it mean? Right? Does it, should we celebrate that we all can get around a guy who is Indian and say, you know, and give him this uh, apex position in, in society, in, in Singapore's nation state, right? Uh, does that say that we are, we we are post race, for example, or the, uh, is is it that, or is it a tragedy that doing that right. has actually, in a sense, neutered someone who could have been far more effective uh, politically, mm-hmm. uh, in policy terms, perhaps, uh, in a position where uh, he could have more levers of power to make changes and to if he were so inclined, right, to uh, change hearts and minds in directions that are more uh, progressive. So if you sort of think of it that way, right, yes, there's cause for celebration and maybe, um, you know, all this catastrophic thinking is is negated, right, because, but I think the real tragedy is that um, if we get caught up in the, the surface of things, it, it, it just reminds me of, of how, you know, at one time we would all kind of celebrate that oh, we're a multiracial society and so on and so forth. And only more recently do we start to see this veneer crack, right? And 
And it's not just a question of casual racism, or whatever, but there's structural things that are going on underneath it. Right. So I, I think that the tragedy here is like being focused on yeah. the glossy veneer of things and being happy because they just seem to be, oh, you know, look, we are, we yeah, are eight, we're now a, a trans political, right? We're trans race, we're all these, we're beyond it, right? We're just technique, right? We're, we're technique and we're meritocratic and all of that. But we lose sight of the what, what's going on underneath all of that, right? That's sorting people into different places. Hmm. Um, uh, which may not be um, may not be ideal, right? So if you systematize mm -hmm. that, then you know the best people aren't necessarily going to find their way to the most suitable places. Mm. Perfect. Um, tragic, right? That is tragic. Uh, I, I have a really interesting question, uh, question about you know uh, what are the sort of counter arguments you would you have thought through, right, or or you might have to think through that might. Uh, uh, suggest that your tragic mind, tragic imagination uh, uh, framework might be, you know, what was the term that you used? Might be lacking or might be, you know, what, 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 what because uh, it's, it's a good question because one of the whole reasons, the rationale for having this tragic, tragic mind is to counter our systemic biases, right? Uh, mm -hmm. or, or of of Singapore's optimism bias, the optimism, optimism and, and also and, and other but confirmatory biases, right? And other biases that this hubristic uh elitist PAP government. But so the 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 the, the question and throws it back at you and say, you know, what are uh, how might you counter your own uh biases uh in in that context? How how do you know you are right uh, uh with this uh yeah. tragic imagination is as, as a corrective? Yeah. Um, so I, I don't say that the tragic imagination is a correct to my, my personal bias, right? But I will say that the um, what makes this book project, uh, of which the first chapter is the mm -hmm. substance of this lecture, right? What makes this book project, uh, which I'm starting to work on, different from my other works, is that it is in fact motivated by exactly that question. Uh, mm -hmm. I have always asked myself, um, what if I'm wrong, right? What makes me think I'm right, right? And just because I can offer a vision of something catastrophic that I don't necessarily think will happen, mm -hmm. but can happen, just because I, I do that, um, what gives me the right to do that, right? Or where is it coming from, right? Is it coming from a good place? Is it coming from a... So that question I've always asked myself, whenever I've had catastrophic thoughts, um, I... You know, I, I, I always go around looking for examples to, to um, negate that. My, by, by instinct, I want to be wrong. By instinct, I want to be wrong. Uh, in all that I have done, I want to be wrong. And um, uh, it, I guess it, it's reached a point where I want to systematically ask yourself yeah. why I ask these questions. And, you know, and, and the book is... is uh, I, I think an inquiry to myself. So this book will be a deeply personal book. It will be a self-critical mm -hmm. book that uh, subjects my own thought processes, my own conditioning, uh, my own personality, my own um, insecurities uh, as some sort of lattice, I guess, mm -hmm. for helping to understand. And then to not not necessarily negate the, the benefit because I still do think that catastrophic narratives are useful. Right? It's just that why is it that I, <laughs> I have to come up with them, right? I mean, um, but I do think that they're useful and we need people in our society who can imagine these, um, these outcomes. Mm. I mean, I'm a very optimistic person by nature, mm. you know, I, I'm... I'm a joyful person by nature, right? But I, I somehow feel that one part of me, and I guess maybe this is, this is, this is true of all of us, right? We're all contradictory in many ways. Mm -hmm. uh, we want the best for our country. We want mm -hmm. to live joyfully. We want to dwell in, the, in, 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 in positive things, right? Optimism, who doesn't want that? Right? But mm -hmm. somehow something draws you to saying, uh, let's not just accept things as they are. Mm -hmm. uh, let's look underneath um, the surface a bit more. And if you think that you have the capacity mm -hmm. to look deeper and more clearly underneath the surface, then it's really your duty to, mm -hmm. to seek these alternative 
visions and hope that you won't be overly punished for them because the intention is never a destructive. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know that kind of answers the question. That's great. No, yeah. I, mean, I think <laughs> the point about how we are by instinct, optimistic creatures. Mm. And then and the catastrophic thinking is hard because nobody wants to be the Cassandra. Right? Uh, yeah. It's not something we do. It's horrible. Right? It's horrible to be Cassandra, isn't it? What yeah. could be worse? You know, you see <laughs> things and nobody believes you. <laughs> and, and, you crazy, and you right? to keep doing it, right? And 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 you have to keep doing it. Because nobody's listening, right? Yeah. Uh, people, people like the sound of their own success and their own narratives. Uh, let me pick up a question from Adrian Kua, uh, our former colleague. Uh, and he says, I love the use of your of mythology. And I wonder if the myth of the Minota might be useful in explaining how the state has, uh, has evolved. Uh, the state getting too large for its own good, getting too oppressive, dominant. Uh, oh, I want to chip in also with, uh, you know, some of the questions related to who might, who might be the savior be in this, catastrophe, right? Who might be the messianic figure? Is it, you know, I, I wouldn't name the names that some of the questioners raised, but do you think this sort of messianic, messianic thinking is helpful? My, 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 my instinct is, 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 is probably not going to, because it, it's kind of wishful thinking. It's, it's, it's a form no, of... I, I don't think I understood the question. Um, the myth of what? The Minota. There are two questions here. Uh -huh. The Minota as a description of the Singapore state being, you know, becoming too big, too large, too oppressive, dominant, uh, that's what do you think is useful as a way of thinking about you know uh, uh, as, as, as an example of a tragedy too and second is I'm just kind of summarizing some of these questions where, where people say who might we look to to avert these some of these catastrophic outcomes who might be the messiah the savior here and and, and I, I, I'm elevating the question and asking is this sort of messianic thinking? Is that is that helpful? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Got it. Um, no, I I think messianic thinking is 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 a problem. Right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's actually yeah. a very centrally a problem to yes. having a tragic mind, right? Because yeah. not only so the, the, not having a tragic mind is already a problem because you've got uh, heroic figures who. Um, you know, with the best of intentions, right? And, and with the best of their ability, they push for survival, for success, whatever it is, right? And they, they really want something good out of this, right? They want to grow and they want to, to prosper and they want to be mm. stable and, 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 and durable, right? Um, and they want to be immortal, right? So it's really a quest, you know, it's like the human, the tragedy, right? Of mm -hmm. humans needing to be immortal, but the only way you can really be immortal is to do heroic, great, deeds right so there's that kind of impulse uh, which you know if it doesn't reach tragic proportions that's great right we need heroic people who will do brave things uh, where others won't right we, have, we need people who have, who have imaginations that exceed the conventional who are um, you know who, who are self-sacrificial enough to pursue these imaginings of a better world we need that right so that kind of heroism I think uh, is, is, is great it's fantastic it's only that when that heroism slips into a tragic heroism, right? Where we ex we, we want to exceed, uh, you know, we want we go and we become extreme, we become intoxicated with our success, we become intoxicated with our results, and we think we can do anything, right? And we we then in in that moment we lose any kind of human humility, and we become that's truly the hubristic moment, right? Is how I view the world, and because I reached this stage, right, I'm going to take it in the direction that only I. Uh, and worthy of um, of imagining and, and, and moving. So that so that's the problem. Now, the example you give is even worse, right? When we not only have the tragic hero that's taking us to a catastrophic outcome, which they can't even imagine because catastrophizing is not part of this, right? So, uh, but not only that, you've got an infantilized people who look up to father figures. Right, even when they're gone, right? Who keep insisting, who keep making effigy, uh, uh, making totems, and you know, kind of creating, you know, like to, just to keep the father figure alive, right? The, uh, and, and in the hopes that somehow there'll be salvation uh, through all of that. I think that's probably the most that, that's probably the worst outcome 
of the, yeah. of the tantalization. If you yeah. think about it, that's probably the greatest tragedy of Singapore that right. we've actually infantilized everyone to yeah. the greatness of this first generation of, of, of leaders, right? And nobody thinks they can be as good as that. And if, in some sense, perhaps unfairly, been put down also in, 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 in people's expectations. So then we, we, we continue to behave like, like, like children, right? Desiring, um, fetishizing, um, you know, the, the ghosts of, the, of a heroic past, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of, you know, kind of willing them into... To, to mm, mm. But but that that in a way is Frankensteinian, right? Because we mm. take dead parts of dead yeah. body, yeah, you know, try to make them come alive again. <laughs> <laughs> the King Likon, you literally, uh, yeah, when he said, you know, you. Yeah, uh, uh, let me read a question by Serene Ko. Uh, I find your identification of the role of the fool a compelling one, but I wonder if the analogy of that character with the various futures-related agencies is the most suitable one. I did have that thought cross my mind also. I mean, do those agencies really think of themselves as being authorized to be the fool? Uh, I mean, uh, you mentioned that you don't, didn't know enough about how they were performing their role, but how do you think they should perform the role? Is is the fool the, the right uh, metaphor? They should. Uh, See themselves yeah. as. I, I think it's a it's a good metaphor. Uh, I, I I like the metaphor because um, uh, for a number of reasons, right? The the fool actually has the license to do this, mm -hmm. so it's not just someone who who assumes right <laughs> that they can go up to people in positions of authority and tell them the truth, right? It's not just is that that they actually their job is to do it, right? So they've been hired to do this uh, to do this function, just as the uh, I guess, you know, SPO and all these things, that, that is their job description, as far as I understand, right, formally speaking. Mm -hmm. And um, what's important about un to understand uh, in, in, in the role of the fool is that he doesn't just speak plainly to the king, right? The fool speaks in a mediated way, humor, mm -hmm. wit, ridicule, song, That's you know, right. all these things modulate the criticism, Mm -hmm. so that it is unthreatening to the king. And the king hears this, right? But can save his face because it's a joke, right? <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's, it's wit, right? And it, it to appreciate wit signals the intelligence of the king. So it's not the mess, you know, the, the message doesn't become threaten, threatening, right? The message, is, the message flows through a, 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 a kind of mediation. Uh, in the same way that scenario planning techniques or whether you want, you know, horizon scanning or risk assessment, whatever, right? All these different devices that are part of the toolkit of a, a futures or a foresight unit. Uh, these toolkits, right? These, these methods, methodologies, they're like wit, right? They kind of defang the criticism so that you're presenting stories, right? Scenarios of uncomfortable futures in a way that shouldn't unsettle the king. Now, of course, a lot of, for a lot of this to work, and here's where the metaphor also works, right? For a lot of this to work, the king has to be also big-minded, right? And, you know, somewhere in there, right, the king needs to understand that no matter how painful this message might be, right, uh, and even as it is hidden in wit and humor and, and satire, no matter how painful this message is, a message that he needs to hear, mm -hmm. right? So th that is dependent on the king, right? And some kings are good and some kings aren't. Um, so again, you know, some bosses are good and some bosses aren't, right? So I don't know what really happens in these agencies in the government. I can imagine that if you are shepherded by a good boss, a good, you know, who can basically protect you and the difficult message that you're trying to communicate in that space that's actually designed for you to do it, then you can do this job better. But in a, in a civil service where maybe such figures are less and less available, right? Senior people who, are, who will protect the, the off-center officer, right? The officer who's, who's saying uncomfortable things. If there are fewer and fewer such people then this kind of space becomes, you know, again, it becomes, uh, on the one hand, uh, less viable as a space where these kinds of messages can be made. And on the other hand, um, uh, they, they, they become just, I guess, white elephants, right? That uh, don't yeah, deliver anything other than entertainment. 
Yeah, they become shells of what they're meant shells, to be. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So, yeah, as again, you were I saying. Don't know, I don't know the empirics of the empirical reality of it, but um, I imagine the theory, yeah. very easily degenerate into that. That's right. Well, as you were saying, I got a couple of messages from my server service friends who said what you said really uh, was, was spot on. <laughs> Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's, so, my Cassandra, it's my Cassandra mind, right? I mean, <laughs> it's quite spot on. Uh, uh, what, what do you think is the uh, impact of institutions like, or laws like POFMA and FICA? Would you put them in the same category as those Frankensteinian policies and institutions that we've talked about? Yes. Uh, also, I want to pick up a question by Arun Mahisna because it's a, use, always useful to check our own hubris. Huh? I says, yeah. can critics themselves sometimes fall into the trap of hubris and self-righteousness, just as the ruling elite does? So even if you have, a, say, a change of, uh, of the ruling party, there is no guarantee that a tragedy has been averted, right? Because this, you know, even the oppositions can be easily become the new elite, uh, yeah. and the new ruling elite, and they could as suffer from the same by, <laughs> As we saw in Annual Farm, right? It was first, you know, Annual Farm started with an overthrow of the humans, right? Uh, but then the pigs become the humans. They start walking like uh, human beings. No, yeah. absolutely. I, I mean, again, you know, I, I, I say that what motivates this work that I'm doing right now is exactly that. It's the questioning of myself, right? If I, if I see myself, I mean, I'm not the, you know, I, I'm not, I don't know, maybe I flatter myself to think of myself as a critic, but if you would grant me that description, then, you know, I, I want to know what's driving it, right? What's motivating? Am I, am I falling into a kind of trap of self-importance or, right. you know, that, that worries me a great deal. And that's why I say, you know, I, before I working on this book, I, I always look for examples to disprove what I'm saying. That's my first instinct. Yeah. And I, 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 you know, I, 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 I greet these examples with joy when I find them. You know that I'm wrong, right? So let me just say that, right? Yes, critics can be as hubristic, maybe even worse, right? Because there's of there's sometimes bitterness that drives, um, you know, the the psychology behind it, or some kind of personal trauma that drives that psychology behind it. So it could be even worse, right? It could be even more cruel. Mm. That's absolutely true. Uh, but let me say also that, you know, uh, all of this idea of humility at the heart of the tragic mind should be something for all of us, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's, 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 I don't think it's hubristic to imagine catastrophic yeah. outcomes, right? I, yeah. I think it's part of humility to accept that we can have the very worst outcomes in spite of the very best intentions uh, and the most well-reasoned um, um, uh, in, in moral terms or technical terms. Uh, options that they choose. What was that first question? I forgot. Uh, it's about POFMA and FICA and whether ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, what's a, uh, what's a catastrophic outcome of that? Well, um, so maybe it begins with something which few of us would, uh, or, or, or people can accept, right? Which is that we do live in a post-truth world. And uh, mm -hmm. so, you know, uh, uh, having... Uh, um, misinformation, disinformation, fake news, all these things can have very real um, uh, impacts on people's well-being and, and, and so on and so forth, right? So we, we have to do something about it. Uh, but if, if, if POFMA is the answer, and of course, in a sense, it, it, it is the answer, right? It's the simplest answer to, to get the, the most legitimate authority in your society, which are the ones that we have voted into power, a government, to make that decision about um, what is true and what is, is not. But then that is very potentially slips into a hubristic power of determining what truth is. Uh, and when you, when you um, combine that, right, the, the, the godlike power of being able to say what is true and not in the hands of a very small number of people, and if you, if you, if you sort of cast that in a situation where there is already skepticism and cynicism, what ends up happening is, is a variety of unintended consequences. For, for instance, now, you, you will reach a point where anything that is Poffman will gain invisibility a thousand times because of the Streisand effect, right? You Poffman something, everybody will say, okay, I'm going to go look for what this thing that's been Poffman, right? And it will gain this sort of credibility, uh, visibility, and perhaps even credibility. That's one. It will also show, perhaps, um, because you can't perform everything, and there's bound to be cons inconsistencies and so on and so forth. And in the patterns of inconsistencies, you might read 
politicization, right? the weaponization of Hofma, which then can call into question the legitimacy of the, uh, you know, the powers that wield Hofma. Then you, you have a loss of faith and trust in important institutions that govern us all. That's one. And the worst, most Frankensteinian, dangerously Frankensteinian monster outcome of this is that you get the very opposite, which is anything you Hofma is assumed to be true. <laughs> right. That's perversion of what the, the original intent of uh, I think that's the real tragedy. I think that was a good that was a good place to end. Uh, and I think you ended in the previous in response to the previous question. What are some of the practical things we can do, both as citizens as well, as well as uh, academics like you and me? Uh, you know, embracing humility as a corrective to hubris and to constantly seek this confirmation as a corrective to our own uh, biases and our own sense of optimism. Uh, it's it's hard to do. It's difficult to do, and that, but that's precisely why uh, we are in this business. Uh, so thank you very much to our fantastic lecturer uh, Kenneth Paul Tan. I want to, on behalf of our wonderful audience, and I'm amazed two hundred people stayed more than two hundred people stayed till the end. I want to thank, thank you so much uh, for staying. <laughs> yeah, I want to thank also our organizers, Academia SG, for uh, you know holding this on the weekend of uh, Lee Kuan Yew's hundredth birthday. I think it's a incredibly meaningful and uh, thoughtful way to spend our Sunday and I hope that we will soon have a chance to meet uh, both Kenneth and, and me with you in Singapore. Thank you very much everyone and uh, we'll see you soon.